shortest intro ever here. Grab a piece of paper, grab a pen, take notes. Jeremy is one of the top marketers out there, helping thousands grow their own agency as well as uh, personal brands of the top 1% uh, grow their brand. So make sure that you take notes, leave a written review, show some love. This is all for you guys. Thanks so much. So on today's episode, we have Jeremy Haynes, a top 1% digital marketer who has helped scale some of the world's largest personality brands to over 83 million in revenue generated and who has mentored thousands through his courses. He's worked with names like Dan Locke, Robert Kiyosaki, and Ty Lopez, amongst many others. And it all started from a position that I think a lot of entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs can relate to. And that's realizing that at his job, as great as it looked from the outside, at the end of the day, he was building someone else's dream and not his own. So he took that leap of faith and is now killing the game. Jeremy, welcome back to the show. Happy New Year, my man. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Happy to be here and uh, happy New Year to you, too. <laughs> Glad we got to uh, work out those technical issues from the first time around. So, Jerry, man, how has uh, 2020 been treating you, brother? Yeah, it's been cool. Uh, six days in so far. Already had uh, three different deals landing, some big people, and, uh, you know, just helping a bunch of people make a lot of money. So, the usual. <laughs> okay. Care, care, to, care to elaborate on these deals or is it a little under the hush hush? Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to talk about them. Yeah, so we work with people who we can take to seven figures a month who are personal brands. To be clear, like they sell information products or they just, you know, have some type of like coaching, mentoring program or um, not really like the seminar guys, especially now during, during all this uh, pandemic stuff. But long story short, two most recent guys, one of them is a guy named Thatch, who um, incredible guy. He's a real estate developer, uh, just different parts of the United States, makes a ton of money, uh, high net worth, teaches other people how to do it. We were just talking with him the other day. Um, got a lot of respect for that guy. He taught me a lot myself. I initially bought his course because we had about 100K a month in free cash flow. And I've just been looking for what to do with it outside of overfunded whole life insurance and stocks. So I started buying a bunch of real estate courses. That's how I actually found him. Second guy was, um, second guy's a legend, man. His name, his name is David. Uh, David Lee. He's uh, one of the most famous Ferrari collectors. He collects like classic Ferraris. Um, as an example, like if, if you're familiar with any of the Ferrari models that are more like the, the, well-known ones like he has an Enzo, he has an F50, he has an F40. He just has a ton of, ton of like I've really seen his collection, cool, yeah. Cool and mm -hmm. uh, super like, like just an incredible dude to uh, to know and like get the opportunity to talk to because his his like <laughs> his depth of knowledge in almost anything that you choose to talk to him about is just mastery level. He has um, a bunch of jewelry stores all, all over the world, um, make up a ton of money. Uh, he's you know investing in a lot of different businesses, but yeah, we were we were talking about getting him launched as well for some stuff. And then um, younger guy, guy named Colin, who we just uh, we'll start working with here towards the end of the week. He essentially leverages business owners like you and I who have good credit to have an opportunity to get zero percent interest loans because you know the government's printing so much money here in the United States mm -hmm. that banks are just literally handing out money for zero percent for like a year or like you know, a couple months up or down from that. Um, so he, sh he puts people on game to that. And then um, a bunch of other things, like obviously ways to invest the money to make it back fast. But yeah, those, those are three people we talked to just in uh, 2021 so far. <laughs> <laughs> nice. When you're dealing with this caliber of client as a digital marketer, is, is your approach to every single one like unique? I mean, do you offer them kind of different packages based on what they're doing? or Because like, I'm sure they have very specific needs across, across the board, right? Yeah, it kind of depends on the person. So um, this is how we're judged in every relationship. It comes down to our ability to turn money into more money. So we always like to stack the odds in our favor when we work with clients to make sure that we have the highest probability of success in the first 30 days of doing that. Otherwise, we find that relationships just don't continue. We look at ourselves like modern day money managers. So long story short, the reason I, I like pre-frame with that before I just answer your question directly, there's, there are specific strategies that you can do that have better odds than others that are easy for people to execute on as well. That's typically what we do um, with most of our clients. There are some though that have you know, different ways of converting people, different offers that are necessary, depending on the demographic that they're selling to. So some of them do require, you know, completely unique approaches, but for, for the most part, like more than half the time, there's, you know, once again, like very similar strategies that we can just do across the board for people um, that once again, have really good odds of working for the person. For sure. And I definitely love to get into some of those strategies. So we'll put a pin in that. But before we get there, uh, tell us about your background, man. How did you uh, get started off? Uh, how was your upbringing like and what kind of led you to where you are today? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Ohio, unfortunately, which is in the uh, the northeastern United States. <laughs> what uh, part? My mom's from Canton. <laughs> yeah, so I was I was actually born in Canton, 
but I was raised uh, in, in this Akron area, which was a little, little city named Cuyahoga Falls specifically. But long story short, the, um, the area just, you know, there were good people for sure. Uh, I, sh- I sure as hell didn't know them. I mean, I was surrounded by a lot of like negative and very limiting people in comparison. Um, I had a few good friends that like definitely helped me aspire to want to get way richer from a younger age, but you know, factory worker for a father, babysitter for a mother, um, definitely didn't have like any kind of guidance or, you know, leadership inside of my own family for like what to do to, to make more money and like just grasp more opportunity. The path for everybody was, you know, go to school, get a job, um, you know, invest a couple dollars every month and then hope to be able to retire at, at, a, at an older age. Um, never made much sense to me. I just didn't like the appeal of like what I was being told when I was younger. So when I was 16, I started trying to do business, uh, bought, bought some video equipment and uh, I, try, I started doing music videos for like local rappers, believe it or not. And then that, <laughs> Probably that, my cousin, that he's a rapper like, out there still. Yeah, that, that went from like, you know, some, uh, some just like my friends at the time to, you know, then I actually was getting paid to do it. Um, and then I started doing like work with commercial businesses, just like filming stuff that they wanted filmed. And it was like a big referral model. So that was, that was one cool part. It was like a, I can't call it a small city because I mean, it was tens of thousands of people, but you know, I, a lot of people had word of mouth. Um, that was, that was a strong opportunity. I ended up doing 60 K in three months and I, I blew it all on, uh, all kinds of stuff like subwoofers for my car. Uh, you know, I won't name some of the other things on, you know, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> you know, long, long story short, I, I didn't know anything about business. Like I completely failed. And like, I just you said you were 16. It. Yeah. I was 16 at the time. Hell yeah. Uh, it was cool, but like, you know, it didn't really feel like a lot of money. Um, Cause like I said, just, you know, it was coming in fast and going just as fast, you know, <laughs> so sure. it didn't really like sit there at one time, long story short. Um, point I'm trying to make, you know, nobody around me even like believed that that was possible. Like people would tell me I was lying when I talked about it. Even though I'd show them like my bank account, like my deposits and stuff. They just they like couldn't handle it, I guess. Um, I left as soon as I was 18. Um, started started working with uh, DirecTV. I was actually the guy like inside of stores, uh, like pitching people on signing up for this in like Walmart or Best Buy, like just the annoying guy trying to sell you DirecTV while you're looking at TVs. That I ended up selling phones because I just I moved to Colorado. I was not good at, at selling DirecTV in Colorado, so like my mm-hmm. paychecks were like 1,200 a month. Um, I ended up selling phones just because, you know, it was a better opportunity at the time, maybe like 20, 2,500 a month, maybe. Um, Colorado was cool, but everybody was smoking recreational weed at the time. Like the year I moved there is when they made it like fully legal. <laughs> so not, not that weed's a bad thing, but to be clear, like, you know, for Colorado people, it just made their reaction time so slow. If I would try to talk <laughs> this fast, like people would be like, dude, you got to slow down. You know, like, I didn't understand anything you just said. Um, and that would happen quite frequently. The pros of Colorado, though, uh, Disc golf, you know, unbelievably fun. Uh, mountain Here, Colorado mountain. has the highest ratio of women to men, too. Is that true? It's like nine to one, you know, it was crazy. It was yeah. Crazy. It's real stuff out there. Um, you know, Between that not and all thin mountain air in the weed, you got some good chance. Yeah. No, that, you know, there's, there's great opportunities out there for a lot of things, but it was just too slow for me. My friend and I, who lived with me at the time out there, he, he had gone to Miami for three days. <laughs> he was like, dude, Miami's the <laughs> shit, you know, like, we gotta go down there. It's way better than this. Like, you know, we're trying to get rich. Like this is not the place. So we, we drive across the country. It was about 36 hours in my, in my 2004 Dodge Stratus, like packed to the roof, you know, just with clothes and like all kinds of stuff. Um, we drive straight there and we ended up moving into the hood accidentally. So we didn't have the money <laughs> to go down there and like, you know, find like where we, where it was safe. And like, we didn't know anything about it. So we show up this like 650 square foot shit box, dude. Like, the worst case scenario kind of place. Like the projects was like a block over from where we live. Like I remember one morning uh, my bathroom window was like slid up and somebody had stolen my shampoo. Like, I don't know, <laughs> bathroom, you know? like this place was, this place was fucked up. And, uh, anyway, long story short, like I was still selling phones. Like I, that's, that's how I was able to transfer down there is like, you know, I just started selling phones in Costco. They, they, they had so many places, of course, they could just like move me from one place to the other easily. Um, it took us a few months to get out of there, uh, you know, but long story short, I got a great opportunity when I was, when I was selling phones down in Miami. This guy named Peter hired me as his head of marketing. So I went from selling phones to my official title was now a head of marketing. Now, I was actually paid less money to do that. I was paid about $2,000 a month. <laughs> you got a cool title. For living in the hood, you know, so like didn't matter that much. Uh, but long story short, I, I now go to this job every day and this guy would just throw totally random stuff at me. He'd be like, I need to get webinar registered. So I had to like figure out 
like what a webinar was and like how to get people to mm. it. And, and then I learned about email marketing and like started messing with this thing called Infusionsoft. And I, I started learning about marketing automation and he was having me like coordinate all that with the sales team. So they knew what was what inside of the CRM and like where people were coming from and how to update things. Um, you know, I had to do create like plans and make it clear, like what we were going to do to drive revenue. Um, I was doing like search engine optimization with this guy, like working with developers to like build out a new site, all, literally just pretty much everything that was digital marketing related. I, I didn't really know um, what I was like getting into, but you know, it was my job and I was getting paid to learn about it. So it was, it was pretty cool. Long story short. How did you meet that guy? You said, I sold sales? a phone to him. Yeah. I sold a phone to him. So he came in, he came into Costco in uh, North Miami. His name's Peter. And he just, you know, he, I, here's what he wanted. He wanted to get an iPhone. I talked him into getting a Samsung because I got paid more on Samsungs in terms of commission. You know, oh, something. man. Terrible. He saw, he saw how good <laughs> I was at selling a midget. Terrible deal. Yeah. He, he asked me all these other questions, too, just about, like, random stuff in the store. And, you know, I just, like, helped him out because I, I knew about the electronics and stuff. And he was, like, he, he clearly saw something in me that I didn't even know, like, I had in myself. And, you know, what he saw, essentially, was the characteristic that he could just throw anything at me and I'd, I'd have an answer for it. And I would like be helpful and, you know, be willing to like do whatever it is that he wanted help with. So he brought me in, like I said, for less money than what I was getting paid for at my job at Costco there. But um, I, I knew what it would potentially lead to. I was like all about advancing opportunities at the time. So I mm. saw that as a huge opportunity to just learn something that you know, like I had no idea like where it would lead to in life. I just sounded a lot better than selling phones for sure and like a much better opportunity. So I, I took advantage of it. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, if you can convince somebody to get an Android over an iPhone, you can yeah, pretty much do sure. anything. <laughs> I'm persuasive guy. <laughs> Not for the record, at this moment, do you have an iPhone or a Android? Dustin and I go back and forth. I got an this. iPhone, man. I'm, I'm all you. Apple. I, every product I have is Apple. <laughs> smart, man, the, uh, smart man. No, so this this was a crazy opportunity, long story short. And I ended up, uh, you know, Peter comes to me one day about four months into this gig. And he's like, you know, Jeremy, I'm just shutting this place down. I'm just, I'm out, you know, like I'm, I'm pressed on money. I'm not doing it. You got a job till Friday. He told he told me this on a Monday. So I, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know why. I just wasn't even really that freaked out. Just kind of felt too good to be true in the first place that I was doing all this. So when I lost the opportunity, I was like, well, I guess back to selling phones, right? But what I did Monday night, I went home. I went on Fiverr.com. <laughs> I, I looked up like you know just professionals who could type resumes, and I like articulated, not lied, I articulated properly like what I just did at this job, and this lady turned it into a fantastic resume, like mm. much more well professionally articulated than like I, I ever would have been able to do. Content is king. You know, I, I'm 19, I didn't know shit. Uh, this lady comes in, like just polishes up this masterpiece resume. And I put it on indeed.com on Tuesday when I got it back. And Wednesday, I get a call from a recruiting company called Robert Half or a temp agency. Yep. They, they told me that there's this guy who is looking for somebody who has the skills that I have because you know, a lot of the skills that I built were around this program called Infusionsoft. They were like, they want somebody to come in. They have 150,000 contacts in their database. Like, they have no idea how to use this system. They have like this many salespeople. They need somebody who's worked with salespeople and trained them on the system before, like we see you have. And, you know, like, do you want to interview for this job? And I was like, well, how, you know, how much are they paying? They were like, paid about 60000 a year, which keep in mind, I was getting paid $2,000 a year. I mean, like $2,000 a month at the time in that, in that head of marketing job. So I nice. paid about twenty four grand. So I was like, I was like, if they do 65, you know, I'll come in and I'll consider the position. <laughs> they were like, yeah, you know, we should be able to pull that off if they want to hire you in. So by the end of that week, this is the craziest shit. By the end of that week, I had an interview with this dude I'd never heard of, a guy named Grant Carnum. And I go into this business and like, you know, the, uh, the best part about the interview series, was uh, the interview process is like, I show up, I'm in this rented suit, you know, because I didn't have that money to buy a suit. I go, I like rent a suit for like 50 bucks. And I walk into the, I walk into the, the lobby, keep my, I have, I have no clue. Like the world of personal branding was not like it was then as, as like you guys know it today. Like yeah. you, you don't know anybody. What year was this? Out of that space. This was uh, 2015, like early, no, late, late 2014, maybe like early 2015 is when I was, sure. when I, was working. I worked there 13 months all together. Long story short, I come in and Dan Pena, you know who Dan Pena is, yep. is, in, the, is in the lobby. And he's waiting. He's getting interviewed for the show that Grant had called Power Players. I, I had no idea, like, who any of these guys were. And I sit down, and uh, Dan Pena was like, you here to get interviewed, young man? And I was like, yeah, are you here to get interviewed, too? <laughs> he, started, he started laughing his ass off. 
uh, he was like, no. <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, I go back, you know, I get interviewed. They give me the job. And uh, for the first, first three months, I was technically a temp. My title was email marketing. So you closed Grant Cardone. That's what's up. I, the thing was, I didn't interview with Grant directly. It was a CEO of a lady named Sherry, who, you know, incredible woman, like very powerful executive. I ended up meeting Grant, like, after I started. I saw him when I was there because he came out and he did that interview with Dan Pena. And that's when it connected. The, the, the lady who interviewed me with Sherry, she was like, she's like, you talk that guy out there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, the opportunity was incredible. Like, I, I can't express it enough. 19 years old, I, I, you know, I would not be where I am today in terms of mentality without just being around Grant all day. That, that completely changed my life. The culture that he had inside of his business was just a bunch of mini grants. Everybody had the same kind of like mental frame. Just I, I, I swimming around huge sharks is what it felt like, you know. And it was, um, it was really cool. I uh, had a lot of responsibility. I ended up being able to successfully articulate like a bunch of digital marketing things that I thought they could do. Uh, they were doing so what exactly did he bring you in to help with the, it, it, to be a little bit more marketing? Specific. Specific. They, had this, they had this big CRM called Infusionsoft, which um, long story short, just it's like a contact database that has email marketing capabilities. And there's some ways for salespeople to work out of it as well to like update records. Sure. Um, long story short, I didn't know anything about it or like how to use it. So my, my role when I first came in was to create a lot of marketing automation, you know, to strengthen the email marketing that they had, um, you know, take that over completely, work with the salespeople on actually training them how to use that system, show them like, hey, here's all your leads that are coming in, where they're coming from, like how to work through all this stuff. And then... Um, the other side of my job was making sure that all of the automation potential was like properly articulated to the team. So I would bring ideas up quite frequently on just all the things that they weren't doing that were possible to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people, both in the creative team and the executive team, like, you know, they recognized like the potential, of a lot of these ideas and they let us take action on it. So that started producing a lot of revenue. The, the thing was Grant's business at the time was built on people closing people over the phones. So you had a, had a sales team, about 25 people at the time much bigger as even at the end of my time there it was ended up being like 40, 50 people altogether. But long story short, the, uh, the revenue was coming in from phone sales. Not much revenue was coming in digitally at the time. It just, you know, Grant didn't have the kind of like digital ecosystem you guys see him have today. Um, it was, like I said, very underdeveloped, like doing like mid range, five figures a month. The, uh, the opportunity was huge and they gave us a percentage of the actual digital revenue that was drove by the creative team. So there was, there was like an incentive to drive more revenue and bring up a lot of these ideas and execute on them. So I wanted to make a lot more money. This was already a huge opportunity getting paid like 65 grand a year. Um, you know, I'm already, I'm already feeling like I'm making a lot more than what I was. My income had just almost 2.5 X already. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, by the time I left, we ended up averaging about $1.8 million a month for the 13 months I was there. So we were, we were really cashing out towards the tail end of that, doing all kinds. Of, he bought he bought the jet when I was working there. Not the jet he currently has. He had a jet prior to that as well. But the uh, and long story short, it was like I made Grant a ton of money, and I kind of realized um, I had a skill. Of like you know, I didn't really realize it when I was walking into there. But like by the time I left, the amount of experience I had accumulated and the mentality that I had really made me like hyper self aware that it was time to go and and uh, start start just selling these skills. I wouldn't really call it an agency. I didn't really know what that was at the time. I just, I knew it was time to just start selling the skills that I had. My income there became capped. It was, I was capped at about 10 K a month, unfortunately. And I just, you know, I didn't really feel as incentivized to, to stick with it after that time. Cause I wanted to make more revenue and I, I saw what I was doing for somebody else. Um, you know, I had no spite against that, but like long story short, I wanted to feel some of that upside myself with what I could do with my skill set now. And I went out, you and never started, started off. The hell out of people. What were you saying? So you, you just, left one day and started your own thing or did you kind of gradually start doing your own thing and then eventually transition out? Yeah. So before I left, I ended up, I ended up having one client. <laughs> this is a really interesting way to generate my first client. So somebody called into Grant's office. Okay. This is, this is a client of Grant's, this is a roofer a guy named Lee Haight. Okay. And Lee calls in and he's like, you know, whoever runs your email marketing, if you want me to close a deal, you have to connect me to the person who does your email marketing. Otherwise I'm not closing this deal with you guys. So the salesperson comes running into the creative room and he's like, Hey, for, for me to close this deal, like this guy says he needs to talk to you. So I essentially got like an internal referral from one of the sales guys at the time who wanted to close that deal. And this guy tells me on the phone, this lead guy tells me on the phone, he's like, Hey, like, you know, do you, do you help with this? And I'm like, well, you know, like Grant doesn't have any services for this. Like I, I have the skill. I mean, I can do it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if they'll want me to do it, but like, you know, I can do it. I was like, I'm not going to close you over the phone, though. you know, like call me later. So I, I <laughs> yeah, let me give you my personal email. <laughs> yeah. So, so he, he reaches out to me and like, we ended up coordinating a deal. I ended up making 12 K for about 
six hours of work. And that completely changed my paradigm internally. It showed mm-hmm. me that I'm working like eight, 10 hour days for Grant, like five days a week, just pushing hard. And, and you know, to be clear, like I wasn't, I wasn't opposed to it. But when I made 12K in about six hours, you know, I was like, wow, uh, this is a whole different world. Like I'm just experiencing now. I remember I walked around, I cashed out that check actually. So I'm yep. walking around this like loaf in my pocket. But I'm, I remember walking up to people in the creative room. I was like, touch it. You know? <laughs> touch the uh, so anyway, I, I, I like about that time. That was about month 12 out of my 13 months there. Like, you know, I was capped to my income. I was making so much money for this guy. And then, like I said, I closed my first client outside of the office and it just, kind of started brewing, you know, and was like, all right, I think, I think it's almost time. And, and believe it or not, no bullshit. Okay. So like I said, a lot, a lot of these big people would come into the office for interviews. Okay. So one day, like I'm already considering quitting. Okay. Like yeah. it's on my mind. I'm ready to go. It's like sometime in that 13th month. All I needed was that and one client. Like, but, but Gary B walks into the office. Oh, okay. Wow. And, and the way that the, the way that the office was set up, like we, we in the creative room had a clear visual of like who was walking in the front door. So we'd get the opportunity to go meet these guys first. And this graphic designer sat next to me. He's looking through the window. He's like, oh, Gary, we just walked in. And this is like instincts, you know? I, I get up out of my chair. I go walk up to Gary. And <laughs> this is like the first thing this guy hears when he walks into Grant's office. I'm like, Gary, I'm, I'm thinking about quitting, man. What do you think? I <laughs> and he told me as straight as he could be. Like, he knew. He knew. <laughs> he's a, he, goes, he goes, dude, just quit. And no shit. I walked out of the office. I called Lee up, that first client. I'm like, look, if you pay me a recurring amount, like, you know, I'll I'll do whatever you want related to all these skills that I have. I just want some kind of like safety net where I'm not to quit my job. I'll take the pay cut. That would be 6K less than what I was making in Grant's office, but it'd give me an opportunity to have my first recurring deal. That helped a lot with just basic expenses after I quit, things like rent and food. I mean, those are the main things. And I just sat in my house all day long after I quit and just pitched the hell out of people. Um, You know, we were pitching all kinds of businesses at the time, just really any opportunity that I could get. I had, I had hired one of the past guys who had, just previously gotten fired from Grant's office. He was a graphic designer. He joined into my team. Then I had a salesperson. The salesperson didn't end up working out at the time. It, it didn't really produce much. But man, I mean, we went hard in the first month. We we got a few different deals that came in. We were yeah. How were you sourcing these uh these opportunities when you first oh. left? You said you hired a salesperson, just cold calling. I mean, you See, were that, doing that's the thing with most people when they start service businesses. Like it blows my mind how little people are just willing to jump in the trenches themselves and pitch. Like sales is how a business exists, you know. So I was like so willing to jump. I'm still to this day so willing to jump into the sales process like any time and just pump the numbers up. So when I first got started, what I would do is I would send this thing. I called it the perfect code email. And what I would do is I would go and like take screenshots from some of these different tools that I was aware of and just things that they could do on their site to make more money. I would show them things like, believe it or not, at the time retargeting wasn't even a common thing to do. So most people didn't have pixels on their websites. So I'd point out to people, I'd be like, hey, it's this concept called retargeting. If you put this thing called a Facebook pixel or a Google AdWords pixel on your site, it gives you the opportunity to collect that traffic and then kind of like an email list. You can follow up with them through ads later on. It was kind of like an education opportunity mm. for them to understand something that can make them more money and just propose ideas. I would do things like there was a tool at the time called spyfoo.com. It's still a great tool today, but the um, they, they give you an opportunity to see somebody's like estimated paid traffic on Google AdWords. And they give you like some organic, you know, ideas about like what's going on in the person's website in terms of traffic. And long story short, same thing. I got to just take snapshots from that tool, post, here's some things that you could do to you know potentially make more revenue. And people would hear me out and they'd get on calls with us. Um, they'd ask what we could do to help, and then we would close a deal. Uh, it was, you know, quite efficient. The uh, the longest part of the process was I would just type in the email up, and what we would do to find people, we would just go down the social media rabbit hole. Believe it or not, it's still one of the most effective things that we do today. We'd find an ideal client. Uh, every page, both on Facebook and Instagram, like an actual Facebook page, not, not a personal profile, and then the Instagram page as well. They give you recommended pages that are similar to the page that you're currently on. So that's why I call it the social media rabbit hole. You can just go down this infinite list of recommendations for people that are similar to the person that you're currently on. And if you're on like an ideal client, there's, there's essentially like endless opportunities there. Um, and it was, yeah, long story short, we just pitched the hell out of everybody that we possibly could. And, you know, that's, that's why we were able to start relatively quickly. And to be clear, also acknowledge the bias that we had where, People would want to work with us because of the opportunities that I had previously just accomplished, you know, what sure. and pe- people, people knew they were like, man, dude, like you just left and you're, you're a Grant's marketer. Like I've been seeing that guy everywhere. Cause we blew him the fuck up. You know, Grant was a content machine 
And I definitely don't take sole responsibility. There's a huge team that, that pushed everything and like really grew the hell out of his brand. But long story short, you know, we acknowledged our role in that. And, and people love the opportunity to take advantage of some talent from a top talent team. So it was, it was, it was a great opportunity to get started for sure. So, so talk to us how that kept on growing, man. I mean, how did you start? Like, when did you really see that inflection point where you're starting to work with the other huge names like the Robert Kiyosaki's, the Ty Lopez's and all those? Took, took a little bit, you know, a lot of the opportunities that we initially got that were big came from networking, going to very high ticket masterminds. So once we got our first couple of clients in, like it only took us about 45 days to hit 50 K a month, which was fantastic. But once again, it just came from extreme output on sales. Like most people did not put in the amount of time that we put into sales in the first 30 days. So they won't see results like that. But truly, I mean, we sacrificed, I had a girlfriend at the time, you know, got rid of the girlfriend, wasn't something that I was going to put time into. And, you know, it was, a, it was an example, long story short of how willing I was to sacrifice almost anything that took time other than just sitting down and doing sales all day. Um, so anyway, long story short, like we had good revenue in, in a relatively short period of time coming in and it was recurring revenue with that. Um, we learned a lot of lessons very quickly, but that revenue enabled us to, you know, reach people that we might've not reached through going to these, these very high ticket masterminds. One of the guys we reached out to, we reached out to him through his website, kind of Greg Reed, um, still to this day, one of my top mentors, uh, tons of respect for Greg. He, uh, you know, same kind of thing, like realizes we're from a top talent team, like wants to give us an opportunity. And he hosts this event every year called secret knock. And it's truly a real exclusive thing. It's not like a fake exclusive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to like it's, it's a limited quantity of people and they mm -hmm. vet every person based on whether you're cool or not. That's, that's, that's how they describe Before it. COVID, uh, he invited me out to that. Yeah. Greg's Greg's a legend. Like if you get the he opportunity to, to meet with them and just like say what's up, I, you know, to ask him as many high quality questions as you can. He's one of the oh, best yeah. people in terms of insight. But anyway, Greg, he calls me. This, this is the most direct conversation to this date I ever think I've had. He says, uh, Jeremy, this is Greg Reed. And I'm like, what's up, Greg? He's like, appreciate your pitch. I want to give you an opportunity to come out here to California. I have this thing called Secret Knock coming up. I want you to come to it. Buy your ticket to, to you know fly out here. He's like, I'll give you a free ticket to the event. That'll be how we meet. And we'll talk in person and we'll do a deal. And I was like, okay, thank you. And he hangs up. <laughs> I was like, let's go. Like, okay. So, you know, I, I risked buying a ticket just based on that one conversation. You know, at the time, it wasn't like a ton of money for us, but, you know, it, 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 those precious resources we were first getting started, you know, like you got to use them sure. wisely. So, anyway, I fly out to California and dude, this event like totally changed the game for me. Um, I remember just sitting in the audience, like listening to what some of the high level stuff I was hearing at this event was all about. Like it was blowing my mind, you know, like really put me on some serious game and expanded my perception. But the people I would get to meet, I mean, just, just crazy high high level people i remember walter o'brien uh most most people i know just don't know walter o'brien but like this guy's a legend yeah. he uh when he was 13 like hacked nasa's database and he had the, uh, the i think i think it was like one of the federal agencies here in the united states like bust his door in in ireland and he when they showed up like he was holding a piece of paper that was like a non-extraditing agreement <laughs> he was like i'll show you how i did it if like you don't, you don't get me in trouble this is like a 13 year old you know they ended up making a show about him called scorpion on uh, nbc i think Okay. And this, this guy in terms of IQ was like the third smartest person on all planet earth. And it, it's insane. Like he was, he was at the time, this was like what, six years ago, five years ago. He was talking about like transhumanism. He was talking about like quantum computing. He was talking about just all these different like business tactics that he used inside of his business. And still to this day, I have his card somewhere. It's, it's a, it's a straight up gold card, with like, with like black matte text on it, uh, super heavy, like metal, you know? And you know, we're just getting to like meet and talk to these people and they're just, like giving you the time of day to actually just have like regular conversations with you. You know, it's not like a bunch of pretentious, like you're not like in a fan to sure. relationship. It's just a straight up, like, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, so we ended up getting some deals from that. We ended up getting more opportunities to go to different masterminds that like you just can't find on the internet. We paid 10 K to go to one called the dollar beard club masterminds. This is um, it's ran by this company called dollar beard club. They'd done 13 million. They created a, the mastermind it was called unconscious content. It was all about like how to go viral with content. And all their speakers were like just all these other top brands. And I mean, two of my mentors at the time, um, these guys like really elevated me as a, as a business person, uh, Dan Fleischman and Brandon Hampton. And nice. you know, I got an opportunity to spend two weeks with Brandon out in Fresno, California, where he lived at the time. And I'm just, when I say these guys put me on game, I mean, I can't, I can't even articulate the level of opportunity that they had access to that. I mean, there, there's, the type of people that would consistently walk into their office every day. And, you know, at the time I'm starting to expand my operations out to LA 
they have an office like right in the middle of Hollywood, real cool, like gym influencer, like just chill kind of pad place. Mm. They gave me an opportunity to just work out of that office whenever I was in town. So I, I ended up start flying in and out of town. Like literally I'm in Miami and then LA and then Miami and LA. I'm flying back and forth like literally every week. Um, like I said, extremely grateful. They gave me the opportunity to just be in their office. The, the type of people I got to meet once again, like in terms of networking was just, insane and that's actually one of the opportunities that i got to take advantage of that got me one of my first big deals ty lopez so they're, they're doing um some work with ty at the time and you know there were different people that at that point i'd i'd come to know in la and some of them would be at ty's house and they'd just shoot me a text they'd be like hey i'm at ty's house like you want to come over and, and like watch me record this thing so i'd get to show up to that beverly hills place that he had and i remember one day dan invited me over there while he was recording something for the smma program at the time and ty was in the back He's getting a massage uh, from, I don't know, one of his trainers. And Ty just, when I, that was the first opportunity I'd got to meet him on like a one-to-one -one conversation level. I'd met him at a few of his masterminds prior, but, you know, when I, this is the first, he just starts lighting me up with questions for like what I had done for Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, I start lighting him up with like some ideas that I think he could execute on relating to some of the content advertising strategies that I've become known for. And he gives me an opportunity to come in and do some consulting deals with his business. Um, he gives me an opportunity to teach in, in the SMMA program and eventually three programs of his all together. Um, took some of my content for a new mentor box. Uh, meanwhile, you know, we're helping Ty. He's Ty at the time was <laughs> making insane revenue. Like, I don't, I don't know if he'd want me to talk about it, but, you know, long story short, like Ty Lopez is a top three personal brand in terms of revenue, without a doubt. Uh, nice. One of the smartest people that, like, I've ever met and had a conversation with. Unbelievable what that, what that guy knows. Oh, he's picking up. Big brands now for pennies on the dollar. That's great. Yeah, he's, he's oh, yeah. a serious legend. Like, you got to have mad respect for Ty. Anyway, long story short, um, while while we're now getting those kind of relationships, like just like in person, actually networking with people, we're getting all kinds of opportunities with big people who are just respecting some of the results we've been able to generate to that point now. Because, you know, along that path of you know, quitting grants and you know, kind of networking and expanding my operations out to the West Coast, we're closing deals and we're starting to generate a lot of results for those people. So now we have like a consistent portfolio of people who trusted us and took some risk on us when we were first getting started that those risk ended up paying off for them. And now bigger people are starting to trust us. So some of those bigger deals lead to even bigger deals. And it just kind of, you know, climbing the ladder, like snowballed to this point. Yeah. I, I was just talking with my head of sales, He'd been with me almost six years now. His name's Leo. He, him and I laugh about it all the time. We're like, you, like, you remember the type of people we worked with when we first got started? And then, like, we just, like I said, we got off the phone with David Lee. Uh, I think it was yesterday, literally. I was just like, man, it's crazy. Like, that guy's a net worth of, like, hundreds of millions of dollars. And is just talking to us on, like, a one-to-one -one level, lighting us up with questions. And, like, we're going to be able to help the guy make a ton of money and just help a lot of people. And, you know, they're just, like, openly talking with us. And just we're able to ask them questions. Like, the level of access we get to some of the top mentors and just top business people on planet Earth is just one of the greatest opportunities of doing what we do, but um, and yeah, all this because you had cool. all this because you had the balls to leave your nice cushy job. So what, what is your message right now? If I'm somebody out there listening who has a good job, but has this dream to go out and venture out on their own, but they're, they're on the fence about it. Like what is your direct message to them, Jeremy? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy to me that people get comfortable with one income because even when I had one income, I understood that like there was a lot of pressure just having one way to make money and, and, I always felt vulnerable. Even I, I never really truly felt comfortable when I was working in that job. I had upgraded my lifestyle, not, not too much. I mean, you know, what can really like five or 10 K a month upgrade your lifestyle to do, you know, it's 10 K a month, 120 K a year. You know, you might as well work a corporate job if you only want to make that much in business, you know, but point I'm trying to make, is like, I was never comfortable with only 10 K a month. Like I just, I knew that there was, that wasn't even like 0.1% of what I, what I knew that I wanted to make in order to really get to that point of life and security and like true wealth that I knew existed, especially just working under grant. Like, you know, it's really hard to keep a small mindset around that guy, you know, like you're, 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 you have like a very expanded viewpoint. So I wouldn't say that I was even working like a regular job, but, but you know, my point is like perceptually what you think is big ends up defining your comfort level. Mm -hmm. So if you look at what you're currently doing is like the cream of the crop and like there's, you know, some expansion opportunity, but there's not like an entire world of possibilities outside of what you currently do. You'll probably get comfortable and just work a job the rest of your life. But if you, you know, really believe in what you can do in your lifetime in terms of potential 
in terms of creating like real wealth you know, in my life. Uh, you know, my, my family is like not handing down an inheritance to me. I don't even have life insurance. You know, like I'm not, I'm not going to get any kind of death benefit when they pass away. Um, I'm solely responsible as like a first family member in, in, in my entire lineage to like create wealth for the rest of my family tree that follows nice. and to take advantage of like what's possible to do. And, and, and not just in terms of money, but like to be able to really help people, you know, it takes a lot of capital. I just always felt like a job was kind of like the stepping stones that I was, I, I was like needing to go through uh, to get to the point where I had enough skills and like the right kind of mindset to start in business. I don't think everybody's meant to start a business. I truly don't. I think there's a lot of people who like wouldn't be able to handle the pressure and like amount of sacrifice that's required. A lot of people who are working jobs, it's really easy to transition from a job to a business. It's, it's actually, believe it or not, probably the safest way to go into business is to have a job, but most people are not willing to sacrifice those hours outside of the office mm -hmm. just to the business. Like they don't think that that means when I say sacrifice, like you're going to go home and until you go to sleep, you should just work on the business. Like you shouldn't make any time for like sitting there scrolling through fucking TikTok or, or clicking on Instagram or like buying shit on Amazon or watching Netflix or just even relaxing. Like, you know, you should be absolutely maintaining your health and like still working out and getting sun and like doing those kind of things. But the sacrifice, once again, is just, you know, it's, it's so like out of reach perceptually for most people to even mm -hmm. consider that. But for me, I mean, dude, I was all about it. Like I was like, all right, I'm quitting my job. I'll never forget the day that I woke up after I quit. It felt like I had a completely blank slate and could create any kind of life that I wanted based on what I was willing to do. And once again, I you always had that confidence in yourself. It was, it was definitely perpetuated by my job at Grant's. Like I, I, I will not in any way, shape or form undermine that incubation period for like how confident I felt going into business coming out of Grant's office for 13 months in a row. It's just, it's hard to say that that wouldn't impact me some way positively, you know? <laughs> so if I'm, if I can distill this down, so it sounds like you had a big ass vision for your life. Uh, you worked your ass off. Um, and as, as much as you're known for being a digital marketer, you were networking your ass off in the real world too. So oh, yeah, you were yeah, just he, busy, man. People. No, it, was, it was really fun. The, um, the opportunities that have come have been like unbelievable, you know, things that I can never like visualize or, you know, even consider would be possible have just popped up, you know, dozens of opportunities um, um, at the most of the time available to us to take action on nowadays, things that we just you know, never would have even thought would be possible before. But, but the point is like when you're in business for a long time, it's like those kind of opportunities should be available to you if you've continued your expansion right. properly throughout that process. When you're first getting started, like the business doesn't exist. You know, I don't have kids, but I compare a brand new business to a baby because babies are the most like fragile thing. You have to, you have to spend a ton of time with them. You have to take care of them. They can't walk. Like they can't even like, you know, go to the bathroom properly. Like you got to do every single thing for a baby. And it's the same thing with business. Like it takes so much time. And like, if you take your attention of it long enough, there's just such a high probability that something could go wrong when you're in that first launch phase. So, mm -hmm. like I said, like most people just really don't understand that basic concept that, you know, it takes a ton of sacrifice in terms of time invested. And the more time you put into it, the more probable it is to actually get off the ground and do something. But if you're focusing on the wrong things when you're starting a business, it's worthless. You might as well, you might as well not even start if you're not going to focus on sales 100% because the business does not exist without the sales in the first okay. place. So, I, you know, those, those basic things are like the easiest ways to, you know, inherit as a belief, go and turn around and just take action on. And, and like I said, do it in a safe way. Like don't create unnecessary pressure and just quit your job without um, so, having some kind of like income for yourself. So your story is a bit different because, you know, you, you did that back and forth between LA and Florida, but you also had that really, you know, ended up building that large office in Beverly Hills. So yes. a lot of people- Three offices all together. Yep. So a lot of people will, you know, go really high up and they'll lose it all. So you went really high up. Um, and you willingly cut it back. Oh, I fucking uh, burned it to the ground. Redesign. It was it was the worst thing. It, you know, long story short, like what I learned in late 2017, at the time I had three offices, two in Beverly Hills, one in Miami. We had out of those two offices in Beverly Hills, one was to house my 13 salespeople. The other was to house like my creative team and where we did all our recording for my personal brand stuff and for like client training, info product stuff. Long story short, it's the people in Miami, they were also part of the creative team. Some of them were salespeople as well. It just, you know, that was where my initial operations were. And thank God they were for taxi. But anyway, long story short, when I had these three offices and I was having to fly back and forth so much, I became so burned out. Like it was not fun at all. Like it was not what it was when I first got started. When I first got started, it's like, 
you know, remember what I said, like I was meeting some of the greatest people on planet earth to learn from, to be able to ask questions to on a one-to-one -one level. I was still able to squeeze that in at, at my peak in 2017 with like all this stuff that I had to do. But man, every minute of the day, I had like 10 people I had to talk to. I had an endless list of things to do that continued to grow and that never, ever got done. Uh, there were new big problems almost every day. And there were so many cycles that I was actively participating in that just never get closed. And I, I don't know if you're self-aware enough to like really acknowledge that when you participate in too many things at once, that is overwhelm in itself. And like people have different capacity and tolerance levels for what overwhelm is for them on a personal level. But like my capacity just really maxed out. And like once I exceeded like probably hundreds of things at once I was actively doing, Jeez. I was like, this is fucked, you know? And I, I woke up one day, walk into the office and just log into Stripe and PayPal and just refund, refund, refund. I refund $109,000 worth of clients, send out this email, I would sing email, copy, paste. I'm just like, you know, you're fired because of this, like here's your money back. And I go wow. to my staff and I had 27 staff, 23 of them gone, um, ended up even having to pay out. There, there, were, there, were, some, there were some employees that um, definitely didn't like that. And they took advantage of me because they all stayed in, inside of the co-working space. Some of them stayed inside the co-working space I was at at the time. They claimed back pay. So that even months later, I'm still paying all these employees I fucking fired. Um, long story short, you know, I learned so many things throughout that process. And it was just not the way I wanted to run my agency at the time. We were doing about 220K a month, netting about 80K. It just no fun at all. Like zero time for myself, vacuuming meals into my mouth. Like couldn't enjoy a thing. And I just realized that wasn't the way that I wanted to do it. So after I made you know, the decision to fire everybody, essentially, both in, in clients and staff, we then scaled down on all the offices, went back to Miami, got rid of everything in California. And, and believe it or not, most people don't know this. 28, so this is the end of 2017. In 2018, Trump had actually updated the tax plan. There was this thing called the SALT deduction, which meant that even though California would fuck you on state tax, you could deduct all of your state tax from what you were to pay on your federal taxes. So in 2018 onward, you could only deduct up to $10,000 of your state tax against your federal income. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was all the more reason to, to get back to Florida where there was no state tax and just put myself back into Miami and get rid of all the operations in California. Good old but, California, man. The uh, <laughs> one most beautiful place. That's where you're at right now. That's where I live. Um, it, it, once again, incredible place, incredible people, but like, <laughs> I just can't stand the tax. Um, it becomes harder and harder to make that argument every day. Hey, Jeremy, I want to switch gears a little bit here and, and really dive into your subject matter expertise, which is digital marketing. Um, so if, if what, what are, if I'm a digital marketer who wants to grow it to be like you, what are some things I should be thinking about in 2021 that I'm probably not even at the level of awareness that I'm thinking about right now? Yeah. So I've developed a lot of skills through the years and, you know, they're all very helpful and they give me a lot of perspective that a lot of people lack in digital marketing, but I'll be honest. If I could go back and I could do it all again, I would tell myself only focus on the things that drive revenue. You know, like in 2017, as an example, we were one of the top 30 click funnel designers in the world. Um, we would spend time like building info products with people. We would spend time like developing long email marketing automation sequences and writing copy and managing people's social media and you know every digital service under the sun we would sell. All worthless. The only things that actually <laughs> matter are what drives revenue, especially when you're working with clients. Clients are going to judge you based on your ability to turn money into more money. I consider digital marketing as the modern day money manager position. Mm. Um, you know, if you look at traditional investments and, and a lot of people getting started, like we'll understand what the fuck I'm talking about, but like rich people care about turning money into more money. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a business, that's why they're going to judge you that way. They want to spend money on you and they want to know that it's going to turn into more money. If that doesn't happen, they're going to fire you. You're going to lose that opportunity. You're going to move on to the next deal. It is what it is, but that's what they care about. So for us, advertising and consulting are the two things that we found have the highest probability to generate revenue within the first 30 days of a client's relationship with us because we get paid every 30 days. So we have to stack the odds as much as possible to turn whatever they're going to spend on us in ads into more money than that. So most clients, to be clear, they're relatively unsatisfied with even doubling the money. So like a two to one return, turning a dollar into two dollars. Like, sure, they'll, you know, they'll be, they'll be okay with that, but like they'll want to press you to, to turn it into more. So when I compare us to modern day money managers, like, Dude, if you know anything about traditional investments, most most people investing a lot of money are like satisfied growing their money like 20% year over year. Right. People in digital marketing are unsatisfied with 200% returns. You know, they want far greater returns than that to like truly be satisfied and be enthusiastic and excited about the relationship with you. So, you know, long story short, 100% of my focus when we do anything in digital marketing is 
how to produce the most revenue. And to be clear, like we always consider the second order consequences of who we're working with, what we're selling. Like we don't work with bad people. We don't work with people who just push bullshit on people. Like we work with some of the people who actually run education companies. Um, you know, I had, I had a kid the other day who was from LA, like blue hair. I, I respect the guy, like I don't have anything against him, but in terms of like wanting to work with them, I wouldn't consider that he'd make seven figures a month. That's a $10 million a year business. You got to be a serious business operator to be able to not only pull that off, but to not fuck it up and, you know, yeah. actually deliver results for that level of scale that you're going to achieve at that level. Um, so anyway, long story short, like we vet clients so aggressively, like we have 20 perfect client traits. We don't take clients on who don't meet all that criteria. We don't work with people who don't have stacked odds in our favor. I mentioned at the beginning of this, like, you know, we have a specific strategy that works the majority of the time for people. Um, it's called a mini webinar application funnel. We don't work with people who sell low ticket products. Um, you ever heard that thing? Sell me this pen. Mm -hmm. um, my response would be, I don't sell low ticket products. You know, I just, I wouldn't do it. Um, we sell things that mathematically make it probable to achieve that million dollar a month goal with a lower quantity of people purchasing. As an example, 200 people buying $5,000 in 30 days is a million dollars. If you sold a thousand dollar product, you need a thousand people to sign up to make that million. It's a huge difference between getting 200 people to sign up versus a thousand. Think of the person who's selling something for like $500. That means they require 2,000 yeses in a 30-day window. You know, divide 2,000 by 30, and what's that quantity of people that need to buy each day in order for that to be probable? So we're all about, we're all about uh, there's a great book called Thinking in Bets. So every time that we do anything in the digital marketing space, we make sure that we have an extremely clear path to revenue. We make sure that that bet is very probable to play out in our favor for the scenario that we want to occur. And we just won't do the deal and we won't, we won't participate whatever, you know, is, pop, is like on our plate to do if it just doesn't meet the criteria of they're a perfect client and the situation is very probable to play out how we want it to be. But most digital marketers I know, they, they, they dismiss that as, uh, as like hearsay. They say to themselves like, oh, clients don't care just about revenue. Like they like the little right. updates I tell them. Um, they like the vanity metrics about like follows. I have a I have a client right now, 4,400 followers on Instagram, does 600K a month, made 120K a month when I first met him. It's been about eight months of working together for that growth. Easily, he'll hit seven figures a month. And in his industry, there's a huge problem that he solves. So it'll be well beyond that too. The scale potential with this guy's limitless. He doesn't give a fuck about his followers, the quantity of views that he gets on a post, the like, he doesn't care about any of that. None of that matters. But right. there's some people that I know in the digital marketing space that sell like branding. You know, or they sell like social media management. It's just tons of bullshit, non-revenue driven services that to be clear, like we used to sell that we just find clients don't care about. So after we've really like boiled it down to the truth and the reality, um, it's changed the game for us. We've realized like clients don't care about time and effort. Um, I have a kid in my inner circle group. These guys pay me 1500 a month. You know, all of them, I think like the, the lowest one makes 50K a month. Most of these guys are like heavy hitters trying to just accelerate the revenue. Um, he sits in his ad account eight hours a day for one client that he makes 70 grand a month off of. So he gets, he gets paid out 70 grand a month, sits there eight hours a day in the account. When he first tells me this, I'm like, you think the client gives a fuck that you sit there eight hours a day for them? Or do you <laughs> think that they care that you're making them a million dollars a month? And sure. I was like, if you don't realize that, like ask the client, be like, do you give any care at all? How long I do what I do? And you know, if you have the balls to ask your clients that, or just once again, embrace the truth of the situation, it's obvious. Um, you're, you're going to structure your day completely differently. I like to challenge myself as a digital marketer. If I only put in 30 minutes, you know, what would I do? And the actions are completely different. They're usually only the highest leverage actions that have the highest odds of producing the most revenue. And your brain mm -hmm. thinks completely different because you like creatively challenged yourself with parameters that are going to benefit you and the client. Um, when, when I realized that, dude, changed my life. Not, not just the game, like it changed everything for me because – I then got to actually like have a life, you know, which maximum which I leverage. Did. Yeah, I did. to be clear, like when I first got started, I didn't set out to have a life. I set out to make a lot of money and, and to help people, but I didn't like have a vision, you know, after in 2017, when I had that just chaos and no time for myself. And I realized like, Oh, I don't like that. That was a hard set of lessons, you know? So the reason I intentionally just burned it all down and scaled back up right away a completely different way. I didn't know when I made that choice that it would enable me to have the level of time freedom that I have today. But like I said, the ultimate rule that has really enabled me to like just have a life and actually have time that I can do things with anything I wanted. I, I love how you're framing this business approach, man. Well, that's, that's the thing. Like, once again, I just don't, 
I'm always the one that's teaching people this. There's, there's never been one person who's come to me and been like, oh, dude, I'm, I learned that rule here and at this time. You know, like that's how I learned that lesson. It's just, it took me literally just scaling up a monster that I didn't enjoy to like learn the hardest lesson of all. Sure. Which once again was time and effort does not matter at all. They only care about the result. And that is like my golden rule for what we operate with for when we work with people. Like I tell clients that those, those three people I was just telling you about at the beginning of this call, I like, I tell clients this, I'm like, look, they ask me, of course, Oh, what do you, what do you do, Jeremy? And how much does it cost? And when I tell them what we do, I directly say, I'm like, you know, we don't do anything other than just run your ads and tell you revenue driven things to do. We want you to have a small team and already have like payroll positions covered. And we can refer and recommend people if you don't that are going to do all the tedious stuff, like build your funnels and write copy for your emails and like be your video editor and manage your social media. Like we want nothing to do with that. We only want to do the revenue driven things. We don't want you to judge us on like putting 10 hours a day into your account. We're not going to do that. We're going to do literally the things that just produce the most money. And we don't want to be judged on anything different. You know, and we, we just put it out there in terms of an expectation and yeah, it plays, it plays out for us extremely well. Fuck yeah, man. So that's how to effectively run a digital marketing agency because you could be the best <laughs> digital marketer in the world, but if you're dealing with some shitty clients who can't pay you and you have no standards, then it doesn't matter how good you are at digital marketing. Yeah, so true. what are some of the how-tos of digital marketing that you kind of referenced earlier, the, um, the strategies that for the most part work across the board and then you, know, you kind of adapt from there based on the needs of the client? Yeah, the biggest thing that we've learned through the years are content first advertising strategies having the most benefit for for like lower costs and higher volumes of buyers or whatever we're optimizing campaigns for. So when I, you know, to be clear, like we still make money on direct response advertising to, so, so, you know, for the people who might not know, direct response advertising is where you're essentially just making the pitch or the call to action to do something. Like you're telling somebody to buy something or to like become a lead or, you know, whatever the situation might be. When when, when you run content first advertising strategies, you're kind of replicating a real life sales process, but just through the internet, you're putting yourself out there with some information first, some education about whatever it is you're selling, some education about you, your company, your brand, and like why people should care about you and trust you in comparison to everybody else out there. We look at direct response advertising as like being the digital clipboard salesperson, like the digital door knocker. You're just treating people like a statistic and just pitching the hell out of everybody. Content first advertising strategies, once again, like you're not going to walk up to somebody in real life and just be like, hey, my name's Jeremy, give me $10,000 and I'll run your ads. You're going to go through an education process with that person, provide value, give them insight on who you are and why they can trust you. And then you're going to be able to make your call to action. So I just digitized that. It's just all, long story short, it's just content first advertising strategies time and time again. Like when I, when I was doing this myself, my results that I saw were lower costs for whatever I cared about, like lower cost per purchase, lower cost per call, you know, or lower cost per application or lead, like by a, by a large number, like sometimes it'd be 50% less. Sometimes it'd be like hundreds of percent less. And to be clear, we look at it like modern day email marketing, you know, cause email marketing, most people don't even like do the math. You know, they, they, they try to build a lead list. They get a 20% open rate on their email and they never turn around and do the math that like their cost to build a lead was actually five times more expensive than what they thought it was in the first place. They act like email marketing is a holy grail when in reality, content marketing is cost me an average of a penny. Most of the time, sometimes it's a 10th of a penny, like 0 0.001 to get somebody retargetable with more ads. And I, I learned that I could sequence content out in front of people before I showed them something. So I could say to Facebook or to YouTube or even a LinkedIn, I could say, okay, show this person this video first. And if they watch this threshold of it, then show them this one. And if they watch this threshold of the second one, then show them the third one. And if they end up watching that, then show them this set of direct response ads and retargeting ads. And we found time and time again, once again, that just absolutely crushed direct response advertising. So through the years I've come up at this point, I have three different content first advertising strategies that I've originated. Um, you know, I even have like a big old booklet that I have on them now that I've like, you know, given out to people and sold. Um, it's, it's pretty sick stuff. And to be clear, like I still make money with direct response advertising today. I'm not saying it's like completely dead and doesn't work entirely. It's just whenever we run an A-B test, we'll typically see if our content first advertising strategies crush it. When I started teaching this, that's when I knew they worked. But when I was doing it myself, I was like, man, dude, I feel like I really stumbled on something here that's the shit, you know? And when I started teaching it, like that's when it really got reinforced because then I saw across tons of different businesses, like e-commerce stores saw results with it. Like any kind of brick and mortar service business saw results with it. Like just realtors, fucking lawyers, like you name the type of business profession and like 
they were seeing results with some of these strategies that I was just, you know, talking about on stages and like making videos about and just, I even, like I said, like you mentioned at the beginning of this, at this time, about 3,300 plus paid students. I've taught all of them these content first ad strategies. And like, I, you know, it's just been cool uh, to like contribute something to the advertising community that works um, that I hadn't heard from anybody else. So it, it's been dope. We've been doing that since uh, back in the day at, uh, at Grant's office. I originated this strategy called the Venus flytrap. And it was hmm. kind of like what I described. It was like a sequence of videos and then the direct response. That was, a, that was the first one that was a real banger. Um, dirty. Super dirty. dirty. <laughs> fucking love it, man. Hey, Jeremy, I know we're coming up on time. You know, you said you have a hard stop here. So uh, before we let you go, we just want to wrap up with our... Well, actually, Dustin, you have like one technical nerdy question he can answer about digital marketing because this is your domain too, bro. So I think... Put him on the spot. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah like that's what I do. Serve kind, of, kind of the audience a little further than the technical stuff, but just like somebody, it's it's a very wide, wide spectrum. Everyone's trying to start an agency or going into e-com dropshipping, Walmart recently, uh, all kinds of stuff. So if you could give like, let's say... Uh, just a couple starter starting points, somebody looking to create a business or create an agency, what would be a couple starting points for somebody to get into? Just a, just a couple answers. Yeah. So just be clear, like, this is going to sound biased because I teach people how to start and scale marketing agencies, but out of all those other like shiny objects out there, like, you know, getting into e-com or drop shipping or fucking Amazon automation or Walmart automation, whatever's hot, um, you know, cryptocurrency at different times, like an agency is a legitimate business model. It takes work. It's not, it doesn't cost money. It costs time to start, meaning you have to sit down and sacrifice your personal life, pitch the hell out of businesses, but you get paid to learn. That's the benefit of having an agency. You get an opportunity to have a business pay you to help generate them results. Those skills, dude, I've flipped nine different e-commerce stores for hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit. You know, I've built my own e-commerce stores that we still run in cash flow with. It's like, you know, my own personal branding products. Like I practice what I preach with that and the entire time. We've essentially had free money to go and fund all those ventures with while I'm growing experience at the same time to go and do those things with yeah, by working with clients and being paid to do so. So it's, for me, it's like the agency model is such a no brainer, uh, but it does not work if you're not going to do sales like the entire time. Like to be clear, I have salespeople throughout the entire time I've ran my marketing agency and at different times I will jump back in if I need to, to just jumpstart it. The business does not exist without sales, but so few people understand that. I've known so many great agency owners that eventually experienced these hard troughs of low revenue because they just, they just stopped doing sales or like they only relied on referrals or some stupid shit. Always like, got to fill the pipeline. Dude, pitch people, you know, like sure. once again, video pitches have been so effective for us. And I'd encourage you to, to upgrade whatever you're currently doing to, to this thing we call a perfect cold video pitch. Just provide value and show businesses how you can drive them revenue, customize it in a video form. Teach salespeople how to do it. Scale the quantity of salespeople you have. Therefore, you scale the quantity of people you pitch in a day. And just go provide businesses value up front and like actually teach them ways to make money. And they'll give you an opportunity to help them. And they'll pay you. Like I said, you'll then get paid to learn. That can then fund all those other fun things that are out there. So that's that's how I've done it. Um, you know, I know tons of other people that might have like a little bit of a savings they're willing to risk. Or maybe their parents gave them some money or Maybe they're just scraping some of their paychecks together to like fund the drop shipping or the e-commerce stuff. But that thing does not appeal. It does not appeal to me when you're starting because once again, it costs money. And like when I got started, dude, I, I did not want to spend money to start it. I was willing to spend the time, but like, you know, not a lot of people when they're getting started have a lot of money to yeah. risk. So for me, it's like a very risky thing to do. To be clear, like if you already have money, dude, jump into e-commerce for sure. Like, you know, you don't have to go as hard with having an agency, but, but still, I mean, think about this. There's a lot of very well-established businesses that have digital marketing teams inside that also create agencies. So other businesses pay them enough money to where they have free labor yeah, that they can geez. use on their own <laughs> businesses. You know, like even established business owners can start marketing agencies because it makes economical sense to. It's like have somebody else pay for your payroll and you use them to deliver results for those companies who pay you and you use that same labor to do on your own stuff. The, uh, the opportunities are endless with agencies, but feel like a lot of people, of course, don't understand that. Like I said, when I got started, I didn't even know what an agency was. I was just trying to sell digital skills and just, you know, just trying to get some more money. So most people when they're first getting started, like just don't have, just like I did, you know, you just don't know what you don't know. So long story short, exactly. just try to like seek new things and become more aware of stuff every day and, and, and use those things you become aware of. That's what leads to opportunities ultimately, just being able to see them. Awesome, Jeremy. Thanks so much. 
Um, I know we're coming up. We're actually hitting right at the exact moment, so I'll keep it short. Our last and final question, being the Dedication to Excellence podcast, is uh, in, in your own words, uh, through your experiences, what does it mean to you to live a life in dedication to excellence? It's just consistency of repeating successful actions. I was, I was just joking about that yesterday with somebody. Um, you know, a lot of people think from seeing like these Instagram lives that people put on display that, you know, being successful and, and excellent is just like traveling and living a baller life and like meeting incredible people all the time. And although that is sometimes true and definitely a part of the process, it is definitely not 100%, 100% a part of the process. Most of your days will be spent repeating the same actions that are proven to be successful for you just again and again and again. You want to work out and get fit. You got to work out every day and eat right every day. People don't see that kind of stuff. They see the end result. You get to flex the end result on Instagram, but man, you didn't you didn't participate in the 12 months that it took of just not eating pizza and, and ice cream and like, you know, eating less calories than what you burned and working out. Same thing in business, you know? For all these people that you see, like like I said myself, you know, for the level of result I have today, man, I've been working my ass off for, for six, seven years, taking big risks, like sacrificing my personal life, doing things that a lot of people are very uncomfortable with. But along the way, you know, it's relatively boring. You know, it's just, you just got to repeat the same successful things every day. You got to pitch businesses every day. You got to hire people. You got to train people. You know, you got to work with clients, sell things, improve your processes. Like the, the more consistent you are with successful actions, the higher the probability is for you to actually have success in business. But a lot of people don't flex the process because the process isn't sexy. Uh, but if, you, if you're aware of that, I mean, man, you have an advantage. Um, that, that's what produces the end results that you see. You know, for people who are legitimately doing it and not just uh, faking it per se, you know, just mm -hmm. repeat successful actions. One, one of the greatest lessons I think I've learned in life. Hell yeah, man. That uh, compound effect. Love it. Yeah. Jeremy, thank you so much, brother, for your time today, man. Again, happy new year. And where can people go ahead and uh, follow your journey? Yes, yeah, follow me on Instagram. I, I don't do the TikTok shit. My Instagram is my name, Jeremy. Uh, sorry for all you youngsters that only have TikTok. Um, but yeah, uh, at Jeremy on Instagram, J-E-R-E-M-Y at jeremy how did you fucking secure that name bro that's that's what's up it's a long story man it's a long story but i got it <laughs> cool, brother. well on that note we'll go ahead and leave it right there jeremy haynes thank you so much for your time my man uh continue blessings you to you and uh hey this is our first episode of 2021 we've set a high bar so expect some heat for the rest of the year and he dipped out on us so later jeremy <laughs> But yo, uh, happy 2021, everybody. If 2020 was a rough year for you, as it was for a lot of people, just make sure you bounce back 10 times as hard here in 2021. Stay blessed. Go out there, bust your ass, network, grind, sell, hustle, all the things Jeremy was talking about. We will catch you on the next pod. Peace.